Really, uh, we have shorter services for all our diagnostic studies that your physician will send you to. Now, I want to the need for acute care when you get sick uh, and need medical attention. Sometimes it takes a long time. You all know sometimes how difficult it is to get into your doctor or find a physician. Now let's look a little bit at the efficiencies and costs or the lack of efficiency. So this is data from the Commonwealth Fund, which was published in 2005. The per capita expenditure in the United States in 2005 was $6,400 for every man, woman, child. <coughs> the next highest was Switzerland at $4,177, and the UK was $2,724. The US has the highest administrative insurance costs of, by percentage of national health expenditures of any industrialized nation. At that time, it was 7.3% versus France at 1.9, the UK 3.3, and Canada at 2.6. As noted by Mr. Potter, uh, CMS operates at approximately an administrative cost of about 3%, uh, and our private health insurance industry at more like, my figures were like 12 to 15%, he had it carried up to uh, 20%. Um, our system tends to lack uh, the opportunities for capacity of improvement and innovation, innovation uh, and uh, with newer and techniques to some extent are stifled. In 2006, 98% of the physicians in the Netherlands and uh, uh, New Zealand worked with electronic health records. And you've heard a lot about uh, what the EHRs will do for us in helping our care improve versus only 28% in the United States. We have the highest infant mortality, 6.8 per thousand live births versus 2.8 um, Japan. We have the highest percentage of patients not filling prescriptions, skipping doses, having medical problems and not seeking care, and skipping uh, certain tests and follow-ups. Now I'd like to just turn our attention for a moment to the role of primary care uh, and the, the primary care physicians uh, with the health care industry uh, care, uh, reform. Studies have shown that countries, uh, and both individual states for that matter, in the United States, with higher ratios of primary care physicians, those are, as you know, general internists, pediatricians, and family practitioners, have better health care outcomes and lower mortality rates. The supply of primary care physicians uh, is associated with an increase in lifespan and reduced low birth weight, weight rates. In the U.S. and the U.K., for each additional primary care physician per 10,000 population, it's been estimated, uh, and this is with good data to support it, there would be a 3 to 10 percent decrease in our mortality rates. Studies uh, from Dartmouth, <coughs> published approximately three years ago, revealed that patients with chronic conditions residing in states uh, where they relied more uh, prominently on primary care physicians at number one, lower uh, Medicare spending, lower resource inputs, lower patient utilization, and better quality of care. The United States with, uh, uh, states in the United States that have been found to have a ratio of a primary care physician one to a specialist of greater than 1.45 had better quality of care, lower expenditures by Medicare, and those with ratios less than one uh, did much more poorly. Hawaii actually leads the country uh, in those uh, metrics uh, along with Utah, Iowa, Maine, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Louisiana, again, had the poorest ratio and poorest metrics, uh, along with Texas, California, New Jersey, and Florida. Unfortunately, the supply of primary care physicians is not keeping up with the pace and growth of our population, and especially with the aging population. Presently, due to huge medical school student debt and a dysfunctional payment system in this country, we're being, 
it's deterring young physicians from entering the primary care specialty. The physician workforce also is aging significantly. And over 250,000 physicians in the United States are over the age of 55. Unfortunately, significantly, a large percentage of those are retiring early for personal reasons as compared to those that are staying in the specialty areas. The number of young physicians entering primary care fields is declining, as I mentioned a moment ago. In 1990, 13% of all in internal medicine residents went into primary care. Today, that is less than 6%. And those stat statistics are as comparable for family practice as well as pediatrics as well. But what are some of the conclusions I think we can draw from some of this data? <coughs> First of all, we agree, everyone here at least, that coverage uh, by insurance for all United States citizens should be universal and guaranteed by law and by public or private plans. Evidence also shows that universal coverage can be achieved by single payer plans or by what we call pluralistic plans, and that's what we have in the United States. And actually, out of most of the studies uh, from the industrialized nations, although some of them are thought to be uh, pri uh, uh, private payer plans, many of them are really pluralistic. Uh, actually, the uh, United Kingdom allows and has a number of health plans that people can purchase over and above what they're getting under uh, the, the National Health Service. The United States should support primary care and changes to increase the primary care workforce. And there are a number of things, I don't want to travel along too long on it, but such things as targets need to be set as to a number of primary care physicians versus specialists to be used are needed. Uh, policies and gender to support those targets, payments for care, con uh, care coordination, prevention, quality of improvements by primary care physicians. Payment to primary care physicians commensurate with their demonstrated value. Create incentives for health care consumers to use their health care wisely. Invest in basic and applied research showing effectiveness of treatment and uh, modalities of, of uh, therapies and decision making process. And one of the things I was most distressed about here several months ago, uh, if any of you ever read um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, or Senator Tom Daschle's book, one of his premier uh, points is he wanted to uh, thought we should establish some sort of a health board in the United States, uh, much like our Federal Reserve System, if you will, but who uh, people with uh, scientific background, physicians, healthcare care providers, economists, who could make look at the data and make rational decisions suggesting better evidence of care for all of us and what we should be spending our money on and what we shouldn't. And unfortunately, uh, we know what happened to Mr. Daschle, but it was a really sound, I think, approach to uh, part of our plan. Um, we need financial incentives for young physicians to enter the primary care fields, and we need to do something about the disparity of reimbursement for primary care physicians uh, versus the specialists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Haver. And last but not least, we have Tina Hobson, who is actually a product of the public health system. She grew up in a military family, worked for the federal government, and is retired on Medicare. Tina? Thank you. I just wanted to give you an idea of when you hear those snide comments about the government takeover of health care. I'm a product of it three types, and I want to tell you about the government takeover of health care in these three areas, and you can judge for yourself whether it's the kind of health care you'd like. My sister was actually born in the hospital at Annapolis, and we grew up in the military. Now, the military government funds health care through general taxes. Doctors and other health care professionals are on salary, Patients get no bills and there's no co-payment. We also had excellent vision and dental care. And that lasted for about 18 years. The second, my second immersion into uh, government health care was when I became a federal employee. 